Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book It Must Have Been an Angel by Marjorie Lewis Lloyd. This book is a collection of true stories related by persons who had angelic encounters, as well as other providential tales of divine interventions compiled from various Christian publications. In our last reading, we covered chapters 4 through 6, where we learned that angels sometimes don't appear unto the ones who are being protected, but unto their enemies. Like in Java, at Indonesia Union College, where terrorism was rampant and everyone feared for their lives. The terrorists wanted to attack the college and tried to force villagers at gunpoint to be their guides. The villagers refused because of the guards in white stationed all around the college with weapons that shone brightly in the darkness but were unknown to the school and its staff and students. Likewise in Sumatra in the 1800s when the villagers wanted to kill the missionary family that was sent to minister to them. They could not because of the powerful guards in white who surrounded the home. In the story of the forester who trusted not in God but in his guns and dogs and the robber baron who was out to take his life, we learned that the work of angels does not only protect God's people but reaches out to anyone for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Both the forester and the robber were converted through the intervention of holy angels. We also learned in the story of the village chief in New Guinea and of Thomas Sambo and his friends also in New Guinea that angels also appear in dreams or apparitions to prepare men's hearts for truth and in these two cases to use such men to bring whole tribes into a knowledge of God and his holy Sabbath day. As we continue to learn about the ministry of angels from this collection of true stories we begin our reading today with chapter 7 entitled Sometimes a Voice a fierce tropical storm was raging and for a ten-year-old those storms could be sheer terror. On this particular occasion the boy was so frightened that he ran into the living room looking for some kind of protection and there stood his father looking out the window completely unperturbed. He knew how his boy felt and he took both his hands in his he had to lean way over so that he could be heard above the noise of the storm. And he said, Sonny, our Father in heaven has sent his angel to be with us. Everything will be all right. Many times, especially in later years, Pastor John, I shall call him that, had occasion to remember his father's words and be encouraged. Many times he knew that angels were present and on one occasion he actually heard the voice of his guardian angel. It happened in the early 1960s in a time of war. Tribes were fighting each other and there were refugees everywhere. Pastor John was asked by a government official to supervise the distribution of emergency supplies. A ton of medicines was ready to be delivered. The cases had been loaded into a brand new Dove de Havilland and everything was in order. But as he put his foot onto the little step that led up to the aircraft, he heard the voice of his guardian angel, heard it just as distinctly as you hear any voice. And that voice said, No! Do not fly in that airplane. He didn't understand, but he obeyed. An old flying crate that was in pitiful condition was used to deliver the medicines. 
But the brand new Dove de Havilland crashed on takeoff, killing everyone aboard. And Pastor John never forgot the sound of his angel's warning words. It is interesting that the words spoken by angels, both as recorded in the Bible and as heard in our own modern times, are often very insistent. No, don't do it. Get up. Hurry. Go quickly. Make haste. These are the sort of words angels often use. Yes, sometimes the voice of an angel has to be insistent. Otherwise, we may hesitate. We may try to reason with it. But danger will not wait. Peter Marshall, in his youth, spent a summer working in the English village of Bamberg, 16 miles southeast of the Scottish border. One very dark night, as he was walking back to Bamberg from a nearby village, he decided to take a shortcut. He knew that there was a deep deserted limestone quarry in the area, but he thought he could avoid the danger spot, so he struck out across the moors. The night was starless and inky black, and the sound of the wind seemed to give it an eerie quality. Suddenly, he heard someone call, Peter! The voice was urgent. He stopped. Yes? Who is it? What do you want? For a second, he listened, but there was only the sound of the wind. Thinking he must have been mistaken, he walked on a few paces. Then he heard it again, even more urgent. Peter! This time, he stopped dead still and tried to peer into the impenetrable darkness. And suddenly he stumbled, falling to his knees. He put out his hand to catch himself, but there was nothing there. Cautiously, he felt around himself in a semicircle and found that he was on the brink of the abandoned stone quarry. Just one more step would have sent him plummeting to his death. Peter Marshall never forgot that voice, and there was never any doubt in his mind about the source of it. He felt that God's intervention must mean that God had a special purpose for his life. Pastor Lloyd Wyman's father, while stationed in Burma, also heard an insistent voice. Messengers came to his home one evening, asking that he come with them to a village about two hours away where there was a great deal of sickness. He hesitated to make the trip at night because he had only a little oil in his lantern. Also, a man-eating tiger had been reported in the area, so he decided to wait until morning. It would be necessary for him to get back the next evening, but the messengers promised to make the return trip with him. He found a great deal of malaria in the village, and he did all he could for the people during the day. Toward evening, with the messengers, he started the trip home. They had only gone a little way when a voice said to him, Light the lantern. He turned to the others and asked, Did you hear that? No. Again the voice said, Light the lantern. And again he asked, Did you hear a voice? No. They had heard no voice. He was reluctant to light the lantern before it was really necessary because he had so little oil. But twice he heard the voice distinctly, Light the lantern. So now he stopped to light it. And the moment he struck the match, he understood. For there, 15 feet ahead, right in the bend of the path, sat a tiger. The tiger, as soon as it saw the light, 
ran off into the jungle. But then it turned, came back, and followed them all the way home. And the oil did not run out. It is not alone for our protection that angels speak. Sometimes it is to counsel us or to encourage us in a course of action. Jack Circle's father, known to his friends as C.F., was a very active and dedicated layman. He was employed for a time by a portrait studio as a sales representative. And whenever possible, in the homes of prospects, he would take the opportunity to witness for his Lord, sometimes leaving a piece of literature or enrolling them in a Bible course. One day, a lady phoned the office and complained about what he was doing, and his employer told him he must stop. CF was troubled about this development and didn't know just what he should do. Not long after, he was given the name of a person interested in photographs and called at the address. On this particular morning, he was very discouraged about not being able to do his witnessing. As he walked in from the street, he saw a woman at the window, waving frantically, apparently at him. She was acting so strangely that he wondered if he should forget about going in. Then she threw the door open and said, I don't know who you are or what you are doing, but a voice just spoke to me and said to tell you, don't stop doing what you are doing. Is it possible that you and I, without being aware of it, have heard the voice of an angel? The Lord's special messenger wrote, Christ and his angels come to us in the form of human beings, and as we converse with them, light and grace fill our hearts. Our spiritual energies are quickened, and we are strengthened to do the will of God. Though we know it not, we are conversing with an angel, an angel in human guise. This statement intrigues me. Does it mean that angel voices speak through human beings we know, with whom we are acquainted? Or do angels, when they assume human guise, always appear as strangers to us? Hardly had I written this question down when I discovered from the same inspired pen what may be the answers. The Lord would have us understand that these mighty ones who visit our world have borne an active part in the work which we have called our own. These heavenly beings are ministering angels, and they frequently disguise themselves in the form of human beings and as strangers converse with those who are engaged in the work of God. In lonely places, they have been the companions of the traveler in peril. In tempest-tossed ships, they have spoken words to allay fear and inspire hope in the hour of danger. Many, under different circumstances, have listened to the voice of the inhabitants of other worlds. Time and again have they been the leaders of armies. They have been sent forth to cleanse away pestilence. They have eaten at the humble board of families, and often have they appeared as weary travelers in need of shelter for the night. And then there was this thrilling statement. Though the rulers of this world know it not, yet often in their councils, angels have been spokesmen. Human eyes have looked upon them. Human ears have listened to their appeals. Human lips have opposed their suggestions and ridiculed their counsels. Human hands have met them with insult and abuse. In the council hall and the court of justice, 
these heavenly messengers have shown an intimate acquaintance with the human history. They have proved themselves better able to plead the cause of the oppressed than were their ablest and most eloquent defenders. They have defeated purposes and arrested evils that would have greatly retarded the work of God and would have caused great suffering to his people. Again, these words have fascinated me for years. Do they mean that angels present in these assemblies have spoken through honest and receptive members of these assemblies? Or have angels disguised as human beings come into these assemblies as strangers and been allowed to speak? Would a stranger be allowed to address the United States Senate, for instance, or the United Nations? Or would an angel have to speak through a recognized member? The experience related to me by Pastor Alger Johns offers what may be a clue and certainly a thrilling example. Pastor Johns, for many years a strong defender of religious liberty, was present in a Salt Lake City committee room as hearings concerning proposed Sunday legislation were in progress. The attorney who presented the case in favor of the legislation was well prepared and so powerful a speaker that our own men were dejected. It was not that we did not have strong and as unassailable reasons for opposing Sunday legislation, but the witnesses scheduled to speak for us that day were weak and would certainly not be able to counteract the impression made by this dynamic speaker for the other side. Just at that moment, a stranger walked into the courtroom and asked permission to speak. He was a large man, well-dressed. He proceeded to present just the argument needed to answer those of the speaker who had preceded him. And he did it with such power that the attorney who had made such a strong impression only moments before was confounded and simply could not continue. The stranger turned and left the courtroom and the proposed legislation was defeated. An effort was made to find the stranger, but he had disappeared. Who was he? Pastor Johns emphasizes that one of our own members could have been prepared by the Holy Spirit and guided into the courtroom at just the right moment. On the other hand, could it be that those present that day in the courtroom had witnessed a dramatic example of what the Lord's servant was talking about? I prefer to think that it was the latter. The end of chapter 7. Chapter 8. Stand-ins. In an amazing variety of ways, God uses angels to guide and protect his children. But sometimes, he uses stand-ins for the angels, as when he used ravens to feed Elijah. Pastor W. A. Spicer, in his book, the Hand That Intervenes, a classic collection of stories of providential deliverance published in 1918, included quite a number of instances in which God used dogs, birds, and even a spider's web to protect or provide for his people. And of course, sometimes he uses people too as stand-ins for his angels. Says my favorite author, our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. A thousand ways, and we need only one. In Bohemia, now a part of Czechoslovakia, a man named Dolantius was arrested for heresy. He was imprisoned in the city of Prague, where he endured much suffering because of cruel neglect. One day, on the point of starving, he turned his eyes toward the grate of his prison window and saw a little bird 
sitting with something in his bill. When he tried to investigate, the bird flew away, leaving a bit of cloth. In that bit of cloth was a piece of gold, with which he was able to buy bread until he was finally released from prison. Also, in Reformation days, a Protestant named Johannes Brenz was taking refuge in the home of Duke Ulrich at Stuttgart. But the Emperor learned of his whereabouts and commissioned a colonel to produce him dead or alive. The Duke, learning of this, sent Brenz away saying, If God is pleased with you, he will deliver you. In the seclusion of his room, Brenz fell on his knees and prayed for guidance. And he seemed to hear a voice saying, Take a loaf of bread and go up through the Birkenwald, the upper part of the city. And where you find an open door, go in and hide yourself under the roof. He found all the doors closed in that part of the city until he came to the land house, later the reformed church. Here the door was open. He entered in and hid himself behind a large pile of wood under the roof. The next day, soldiers arrived in Stuttgart and searched every house in the city. They came into the land house and searched every room. They even thrust their spears through the woodpile behind which he lay, but they did not find him. Two weeks later, they left Stuttgart. How did Brenz manage during those two weeks? On the very first day of his concealment, along toward noon, a hen came and laid an egg behind the woodpile. This she did each day. The egg quenched his thirst, and the loaf of bread satisfied his hunger. The hen stopped coming on the day the soldiers left the city. A thousand ways to provide, remember? In the year 1662, 2,000 ministers had been ousted from the Church of England. One of them, pursued by enemies, sought refuge in a malt house and crept into the kiln. Almost immediately, a spider began to weave a large and beautiful web across the narrow entrance. The web was between him and the light, and as he watched, he was so fascinated by the skill of the insect weaver that he forgot his own danger. When the delicate network had crossed and recrossed the mouth of the kiln in every direction, the pursuers of the minister came in search of him. He listened as they approached and heard one of them say, It is of no use to look in there. The old villain can never be there. Look at that spider's web. He could never have got in there without breaking it. Yes, God can use even a spider's web. Turning to our own times, Rob Sherman tells of an experience from his days in coal portering. He felt he should make about 20 calls a day, but on one occasion he found himself in an area known for its mean dogs. At almost every house there was at least one, and they were not on a leash. He could just look down the street and see the ferocious creatures he would have to encounter. Rob did, of course, what all good coal porters do about their problems. He prayed. Prayed for both guidance and protection. And then he started out. At the first house, there was no problem, nor did the dogs bother him at the second house. At the third house, as he stood talking with the lady at the door, she said to him, Is that your dog sitting out there? He turned to look. There was this very large dog, a sort of English bulldog type, 
He was just sitting there, not barking. But his appearance was such that a person would think twice before encountering him needlessly. And apparently, the neighborhood dogs shared that feeling, for they did not approach him. He told the woman he had never seen the dog before, neither had she. At the next house, it was the same. Is that your dog sitting out there? And so on down the street. The dog followed him from house to house, quietly waiting as if he were on guard. The neighborhood dogs didn't come near. No one knew where the strange dog came from. And when Rob had finished at his last house, the dog disappeared. As if he were on guard? Maybe he was. Evidently, he was. Did an angel put him there? And then there is the story of Brownie, a smelly, snarly, stubborn dog. The pastor's wife was returning from a meeting late at night. Her husband was out of town, and she and the children were alone. She let herself in quietly, and was surprised to find the kitchen light on with Ted studying at the table. They commented briefly about the wet weather. Then she looked down and gasped. There was Brownie, their huge mangy dog stretched out at Ted's side. Ted, what's Brownie doing in the house? You know he's never stayed inside before. Ted looked and shrugged. He just wanted in, so I let him in. Then I decided I might as well bring my homework down here. Brownie wanted in. That was utterly incongruous. So was everything else about the dog. Black, brown, and smelly. He wandered to the parsonage one day and just decided to stay. He adopted the family became fiercely protective of every one of them, loved them so much he wanted to be wherever they were, anywhere except inside. When they brought him inside, he exhibited a severe claustrophobia. He would race in terror from door to door and window to window till they let him out. No amount of coaxing or bribing could keep him in. Until now. There he was, lying calmly in the kitchen like an ordinary house dog. Shaking her head, she went down to the basement to bolt the door leading to the outside. She came back up, Ted had gone to bed, and she was ready for sleep herself. But better put Brownie out first. Brownie refused to budge. The pastor's wife wheedled and coaxed, pushed and pulled, tried to bribe him to the door with a piece of meat. He wouldn't move. She picked up his hind end and yanked him towards the door and out of it. Like Quicksilver, she says, his front end slid back in. And so it went. She gave up, shut all the doors to the kitchen and went wearily to bed. The next morning, Brownie reverted to his true nature and tore frantically out of the house. Still puzzled and wondering why the dog had been so determined to stay in the night before, she started downstairs to turn on the furnace. At the bottom of the stairs, she felt a breath of cold, damp air. And then a wave of panic hit her. The outside door was open. Was someone in the basement? No, she had bolted the door. Someone had gone out of the basement. Someone had been in the basement, had been there when she went down to bolt the door. Now it all made sense. Whoever was in the basement had heard her noisy and unsuccessful attempt to get Brownie out, and he knew that he would have to come up through the kitchen and encounter that stubborn dog 
or else just go back out the way he had come in. Had the Lord given their guardian angel, instead of glorious dazzling wings, four stubborn mangy feet on that wild stormy night, as she suggests? I would prefer to say that Brownie was a smelly, snarly, stubborn, but effective stand-in. And then God uses brave men too as stand-ins for the angels. George Buttrick tells the story of a hero of the Chinese rice fields. It happened during an earthquake. From his hilltop farm, he saw the ocean swiftly pull back, like some ferocious animal crouching for the leap, and he knew that the leap would be the tidal wave. He saw too that his neighbors working in the fields below must somehow be brought to his hill and fast or be swept away. His own rice had already been harvested. There it was, still in the husks, the cut plants piled in huge stacks, practically his total food supply. But without a moment's hesitation, he set fire to the stacks and furiously rang the temple bell. His neighbors thought his farm was on fire and rushed to help him. Then, from that safe hill, they looked down and saw the water swirling over the fields they had just left and knew how much their rescue had cost. Yes, God alone, from his high eternity, could see the tidal wave of sin crouched, ready to rush in and sweep us away. He knew that only a sacrifice could save us. And so he set heaven afire with his own love, made a daring descent to earth, and climbed upon a cross to die. And only when we flee to the high safety of that cross, drawn by that incredible fire that lights up all the ages, only then can we look back and see the depth and the fury of the ruin from which he saved us and understand the cost. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And for those who linger in the low fields, unaware of danger, there is still the insistent ringing of the bell. The end of chapter 8 of It Must Have Been an Angel. <laughs>